Hello, dreamers. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to the podcast on YouTube and iTunes and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at livingthedream506. But most importantly, keep listening and let me know what you think. My guest today is one of the producers and head writers for one of the greatest animated shows of all time, Family Guy. He's also co-wrote movies like Ted and A Million Ways to Die in the West. He worked at Saturday Night Live for a few years in the 90s, which we talk about a bit. And this whole episode was a ton of fun for me. And this guy is a genius, and it was an honor to talk to him. Please give it up for Alec Salkin. Alec, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. You all you're set supposed, to... You're supposed to say live in the dream. <laughs> I fucked it up already. <laughs> I'm not here. This isn't happening. That's great Radiohead. <laughs> I love Radiohead. Me too. You ever seen them live, I assume? Once. Once. Fantastic. When did you see them? 2014. 14 um so might have been king of the or no that was a little earlier right whatever the one um, maybe the moon shaped pool i don't know moon shaped pool was awesome yeah um they played a lot of moon shaped pool last time i saw them in boston 2018 oh nice yeah where'd you see them uh in outside boston at the um What's it called? I forget what it's called now. It used to be called Great Woods. It's like the outdoor theater. Oh, uh, it's got like it a, Man- Mansfield. Yeah, I think it's the Xfinity Center now. Yeah, I knew it had a corporate name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw. I've seen a lot of shows there actually, and it keeps changing names, just like everything. Yeah. Oh, they're awesome. Yeah, I think I saw them. You said 2014. I might have seen that same tour in Montreal, too, actually. So good. Yeah, one of the best. Just awesome. Awesome, awesome. And the concert was great. They just sound... They're able to pull off, like, almost, like, studio quality sound with the complicated stuff they do. It's crazy, you know? And his voice is amazing. But it's almost even better. Like, they're able to kind of emit those emotions that they're trying to put in the music i don't know i can't really explain it it's insane what they do yeah 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 no watching tom like perform like that is adds a an extra element that you don't get like just listening on headphones yeah well the last time i saw them they played so when they played the tourist they had a it was like a holographic planet above the stage that was just slowly rotating right it, sat, it sounded like steel grinding against steel like that that sound that they get for the for the tourist and oh man so like yeah the live element of music is always better but their light show isn't just a light show it actually incorporates right the, the world into it it was oh it's just mind-blowing really cool so what's going on with you um uh, not much are we is this started yeah we can we can include that or we can cut it <laughs> oh sure that's <laughs> fine um yeah you know what's up with me just working from home like a lot of people and uh it's been going well you know working on family guy and we do the zoom uh writing just like this and uh it's been good so far yeah so, so just basically like a writer's table 
with Zoom? Right. Yeah. And the way we work, we have a bunch of writers anyway. We have like 20. So okay. um, when we get together, we'll divide up into like three rooms to make it a little more manageable. And yeah. that's the way we work when we're in the office anyway. So it was an easy transition. Yeah. So is animation and stuff still happening or like, yeah, so every, the process is still basically the same, just not everybody together. That's right. So yeah, animation is um, oddly kind of well suited to this craziness. Um, we have our animators work from home that, you know, it's all computer program now. And uh, then it gets sent to uh, Korea and they're the colorists over there. And, you know, they're managing how they're managing. I think South Korea is allegedly doing a great job with this uh, thing. So, um, and yeah, and we write from home and people record from either like a mini studio or their closet or whatever it is. So it's been working pretty well. Whereabouts are you? I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. Um, yeah, I live, I can actually walk to work. So I'm right here kind of in the middle of Los Angeles. Yeah. They just extended the lockdown there, didn't they? They did, yeah. It seems like uh, they're taking it pretty seriously, which, uh, you know, I respect. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, so many unanswered questions. I'm not going to drag out the COVID bullshit talk, but, I mean, at least you're still able to do what you guys are doing, which is great. Yeah. No, yeah. on, on a regular day what like what else do you do uh on a regular quarantine day like actually before quarantine like what's a do you write on other things are you doing any other projects things like that yeah well i'm developing um like a, a show uh half hour kind of comedy drama uh live action and uh it's just kind of about uh boston where i grew up and uh, so I've been, I work on that sometimes and I'm kind of in the process of updating drafts and you know, nobody's really rushing right now to get anything in production. So, you know, I feel yeah. like there's a good amount of time to actually focus on it. But other than that, in a normal day, I mean, I go for walks and I go to work and I hang out with my wife and daughter and then I watch a shit ton of TV. <laughs> like everybody, right? Yeah. Um, so this live action show, is that, has that been announced or has it been pitched even to anybody yet? Well, it's, so we're at the point where it's been pitched and, and they want, you know, then you have to write a script for them. So I've, I've written a script, they've given me notes and now I'm in the process of trying to implement those notes uh, and then give it back to them. Right. So we're, it's, you know, it's kind of in the going through the usual channels. Yeah. Is there anything you can tell us about that or is it pretty hush hush well, right now? No, it's not, there's nothing hush hush about it. It's uh, you know, we, we hope that it's going to be called mass holes and okay. uh, it's just about a family in South Boston, an Irish family, uh, three brothers and their dad and shenanigans that ensue. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Is it, is it based off your life? Like, is that what your music? Actually, or? no, not at all. I mean, no. it's based off, uh, just things that I've seen and come across and, uh, just a general awareness of kind of Boston culture because I grew up in the suburbs, not Boston proper, but oh, okay. close enough that I was there a lot and, you know, witnessed some insanity. Right. So the show's got three brothers. Is that, what was your childhood like? Do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have an older sister, um, uh, significantly older than I am. She's nine, eight or nine years older, depending on the time of year. Right. And uh, she's awesome. She's a professor at, uh, in St. Louis now at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, yeah, she's got two kids. But yeah, we were, listen, it, when you're nine years apart, it's, it, there's good and bad because I feel like we weren't necessarily as close as we might've been had we been 
two or three or even four years apart. Um, but also it was nice because there, there was really no conflict. Like we would never, we're not fighting over the same toys. Like we're right. totally different stages of development. So there's really no conflict whatsoever. And she was always very, you know, sweet and kind to me and felt like kind of an extra, extra mom. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how did, how did you get into like comedy? What was, what did that come from in your childhood or did it come from your childhood? Yes, I would say it did. I, both my parents are very funny and in different ways. My dad is hilarious and incredibly negative. Right. Uh, my, my mom is also underratedly negative, but she's, there's a lightness to her. She's, you know, a little more silly, I would say. Um, but they're both very funny. And so I would just kind of absorb their comedy. Other people in my family were pretty funny, uh, just characters. And, um, and also we would watch funny stuff together. You know, my dad would show me these British comedies from the fifties that I never would have seen, you know, and then things like Monty Python later and all that. And my mom was, you know, every, uh, Saturday morning we'd watch Looney Tunes together like you know we'd watch like Tootsie over and over or The Odd Couple or something so I feel like I just got a lot of different comedy influences growing up and then that just turned into you know being kind of a class clown and and uh, understanding that maybe I could express myself uh, through writing and um, yeah so just kind of went from that being sort of the family cut up to then in college where I was just like a total stoner, not doing anything. Like, I mean, I was not barely going, doing the very bare minimum. I, it was suspenseful when I got my uh, diploma, when I opened it up, I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I was lucky enough in my uh, senior year to get an internship at Saturday Night Live. Um, okay. Because I went to school in Connecticut, so it was pretty close. Uh, so I arranged it so my schedule uh, was classes Monday through Wednesday, and then I would take the train down to New York Wednesday night, and I'd be at SNL Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, and come back Sunday night. It was awesome, you know, especially as a 21 year old, it was just like the greatest thing ever. So, I was able to parlay that into a job after college as a writer's assistant at Saturday Night Live. And I was there for a couple of years, then was fired, which so rarely happens at SNL. And uh, yeah. <laughs> somehow I was fired. I've, I've told the story so many times I feel bad because it's, it's ridiculous. But the short, short version is that one evidence number one i was not a good writer i was just not organized we you needed right. back then to be kind of like organized and on it and i was like stoned enjoying myself i wasn't the best that said it's very hard to get fired from snl um there was a, a sound guy there at the time who literally burned his office down with a crack pipe and he was not fired so like <laughs> it's very hard but then so one day in the summer when we're waiting to go back, I get a call from this a really actually nice, good guy, Mike Shoemaker, uh, to tell me that I was fired. I was flabbergasted. It turns out Regis Philbin's daughter, whose name is JJ, uh, went on the Regis Philbin and Kathy Lee morning show and like... Regis was like, all right, JJ, go, you know, tell the folks what you want to say. And she addressed the camera directly and said, Lauren Michaels, if you're out there, I would like a job at Saturday Night Live. And then, like, I was fired and she had my job. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a really, because my life in that moment, like, I was still in, very young. I was like 23, but I could see my life in front of me. I was like, oh my God, I'm working at SNL. Like, I'm occasionally getting little jokes in on update or little getting to write little promos here and there. Like, I know that if I stay here, I can become a writer and then I'll just be that forever because, that you know, that's like, especially as an East Coaster, I was like, oh, I'd love to live in New York. And just then I was fired and I was like forced to do a start stand up like a friend of mine and I were fired on the same day, not from SNL. Um, but and we said, all right, this is it. 
let's give ourselves a couple of weeks and then we're doing stand up. We're going to do it. And we started, and this is 1996, and I did that for a couple of years and then was lucky enough to get a job on The Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn that was out here in LA. That was 1999, and I've kind of been working out here since and got to Family Guy 2004, and I've been there mostly since then. Right. So you didn't start with, when Family Guy started, you weren't with them at that time? No, no, that was... When they were starting, that was like right when I had arrived out here and was working on Kilborn. And I, I happened to meet Seth um, when I was, the first show I worked on after Kilborn was this short-lived sitcom on Fox called The Pits. Um, but it was created by this hilarious guy, Mike Scully, um, who was a Simpsons guy. And uh, it just had the greatest writing staff. All the other writers were so funny and so nice. And one of the writers on the show was Seth because Family Guy, it was the period where Family Guy had been canceled and was no longer on yeah. the air, but they wanted him to work on a Fox show anyway, because he had a deal with Fox. So he worked on the show, The Pits, and we are, you know, are about the same age and we became friendly and started hanging out outside of work. And uh, he's, I just remember clearly him saying to me outside a karaoke place, he's like, you know, they're talking about bringing Family Guy back. If they did, you should, you know, come work there. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. Like that's ever going to happen. And sure enough, it did. And I've been there for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. How many, how many years were you with SNL? Was it like two or three? Three, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Who, what was the cast then? I'm trying to. Um, it was the, it was an interesting time because it was the very end of the, uh, Mike Myers, Adam Sandler era. So that was like 94, like David Spade yeah. was still there. And they had like kind of an, a, it was a weird cast that year. They had like Janine Garofalo and oh, yeah. Michael, Michael McKeon and, uh, things like that. And then it was there was a huge switch they got got rid of everybody and then it started with will ferrell and sherry o'terry and uh molly shannon daryl hammond people like yeah. that so it was a, it was a very interesting time was so was will ferrell starting when you were gone or right as you right before you left right before i left I, I was there i got i was there for his first year okay his first full season and he was instantly hilarious it's funny because people didn't at first like didn't love that snl cast like when they those guys came on i remember there was some article in a magazine that was like new uh saturday night dead <laughs> and you know then this whole article about how the show can never recover and it stinks now and then you know of course will ferrell becomes like the funniest guy on the planet and uh right. and that Watching that in season one was great. Seeing some of his early characters and the table reads and, and he was just always hilarious. How did you like that experience with SNL? Like, was it as, as stressful as everybody says or do you give a fuck? Is it just awesome? Oh, I thought it was awesome. I, I loved it. It was, listen, I'm sure the people who had stressful jobs there were under stress, you know, like the people in production and, makeup and lighting and costume changes and all that shit and the writers you know i mean of course having to do that week after week but for me it was really i mean again i had to like organize people's meals like i wasn't the writer's assistant that was like typing down everything that was said because they didn't have that people were right. just like writing shit down on pads and paper you know and uh so the stress for me was like making sure that a giant dinner order got from the, the curb in through the lobby and up to them to eat. And then other than that, it was just kind of like, how can I sneak down close to the stage and watch them rehearse or like listen to a band or, you know, whatever it was. It was really fun. Well, what was the best band you saw on the show? Oh, that's a good question. I feel like I got a lot of really bad ones, but <laughs> um, I wonder if anyone stands out. I feel like I was there for Green Day. Oh, yeah. The they, early 90s stuff, yeah. Yeah, when they first came. And I think they were awesome. 
And I remember really enjoying, um, it's funny, they didn't, they, they kind of were big for a little while. And that, that band uh, Live. Oh, yeah. I saw them last year. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they were doing oh, like a reunion tour with uh, Our Lady Peace and Bush. Right. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> anyway, they were... Nostalgia tour. I remember they were really good. Um, and it was interesting, you know, it was like a lot of the younger bands just sounded so much better because they had so much like energy behind them. And sometimes we'd get somebody like, uh, you know, somebody like Eric Clapton or something would be there and you'd watch and it would somehow just be not as exciting. It just felt like you were watching VH1, you know, yeah. whereas like when the, when those other bands got there, it was like, you could feel the room really kind of bouncing, which was cool. Yeah. It's fun to see those old videos of the bands playing like, tragically hip and like rage against the machine and stuff from right. just like that's their big break at the time right so they're just everything they've got into one or two songs it's just fucking awesome yeah yeah so with st stand up how come that never stuck or did it like do you ever step on stage anymore or? no well I'll, the the main reason it didn't stick was i was not a good stand up um i lacked uh a character uh, i lacked energy I lack the ability to connect with the audience in any meaningful way. Right. Um, but I felt like the one thing I was like decent at was writing jokes. So sometimes I could get by on just like, you know, the, the material itself. But even, even there, I was very lazy about it where somebody great like Jim Gaffigan or obviously like Seinfeld, and and most of the comics who are incredibly successful, if you watch them, A, they have a character, B, they have energy. And even if they're pretending to be low energy, they have a lot of energy. Um, but C, they have these bits that are not just isolated jokes, but rather like four minute chunks on something very simple. You know, I remember Jim Gaffigan used to do a lot in his act about uh, water. You know, people buying bottled water and water. And, and like, it was just like, the most simple subject that he was hilarious about for like four minutes at a time. And now if I had two jokes that were connected together, that was a lot. And so, I mean, the, the way to be good, which it, it took me far too long to realize was just to sit down and, and build your bits out like they did. But I never did that. I would just think of some funny or weird thing in the moment and then write that down and be like, this is part of my act now. Um, right. it, you know, that's why when when Twitter came, I felt like I was much more suited to that because that doesn't that you don't need anything before or after. It's just here's this little stupid thing. Yeah, I remember like that was the heyday of Twitter when that's how I found you actually. Like I've always watched family Guy since day right. one, but I never knew who was writing or anything sure. like that. And with Twitter, they always had like the top funny tweets of the month or whatever. And it was always you. And that's when I first was really exposed to you and then started looking up what you do and see if you're a stand up, things like that. Right. And then that's when I found that you're a family guy writer and yeah, I, I mean, I've been following you on Twitter since Twitter started and yeah, that's what, it's awesome. Yeah, those were the days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's definitely changed, but. I know Twitter is just feels like such a, such a weird, sort of dangerous <laughs> post-apocalyptic ghost town now, you know? Yeah. Um, but Instagram's fun, so. I love what you're doing on Instagram now. Oh, cool. It's just hilarious. Thank you. <laughs> what yeah, was I, today? Uh, what was the name you were saying today? Oh, yeah, my, uh, my friend Fogarty. <laughs> Where's yeah. Fogarty? Yeah, that's my my <laughs> uncle Nunchi. Always, every time I saw him, it was like, "How are you? Where's Fogarty?" <laughs> he just loved uh, doing that. That's uh, so funny, and like the Cuomo shit that you've been doing is just yeah, topical, it's, it's really hilarious. Fun, you know. My my wife always said, you know, like about Instagram. She's like, you should do like try and do like be funny on Instagram. And I was like, no, it's a place from you know pictures of my kid and all that kind of shit. And then when all this, you know, the flu broke out and we all had to stay at home, I just felt like, well, all right, maybe I'll try it because yeah. Twitter is, just feels so weird now that maybe I'll right. be excited about this. So it's been fun. 
Yeah. Is it, do you see it as a bit of an outlet, like for material you don't get to use in shows? It definitely can be for sure. Yeah. There was something that I did. I forget. I did the other day and I remember having that thought of like, Oh yeah, we, you know, this was almost in family guy. This was, you know, yeah. some joke that I had pitched. I wouldn't take anyone else's that, uh, was like somehow going to be in the show, but then it wasn't. And uh, here I am. I'm, I'll use it here. Yeah. 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 Like, uh, Ben Schwartz, he, uh, his Instagram and Twitter is rejected jokes. And like, he used to write for late night as well. And any jokes that didn't get picked up, he'd post them on there. Right. I, that's kind of where I saw, like wondered if that's what your Twitter account was with a little more edgy things that, Right. Maybe yeah, I can get know. pushed through. I don't know if I did that on Twitter as much because I felt like at least when I started and was kind of excited about Twitter, like that I was it trying a little bit to to be a, kind of like a me character. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I would pitch for Family Guy it would be, you know, in supposed to be Quagmire or Peter or Stewie or something, and and it didn't really fit for my particular sort of like negative guy character. Yeah. I got a bunch of fan questions, but um, that just kind of reminded me, my son actually was wondering who, who is your favorite character on family guy? And I Peter. guess, so like more importantly to write for, is it still Peter? Yeah. for yeah, sure. I, right? Yeah. I mean, he's like just a really, really funny character. I, and I love his combination of, uh, sort of uh confidence and stupidity uh, i just think he's the most fun to write for whenever i i would write an episode uh it, i was always much happier if it was like a peter centric thing yeah they're definitely better than like the stewie Bryan plot lines right well it depends in whose hands we have that writer gary Janetti who writes like the greatest scripts on the show and uh so he usually he loves stewie and so he likes to take the Stewie Brian. He did that one of them in the bank vault and, you yeah. know, all those different kind of like the therapy session with Stewie and uh, Ian McKellen. So, yeah. Uh, but I, I, for me, I think for a lot of the guys, Peter's kind of a home run hitter. Yeah. Well, that bank vault episode was almost more well written than it was like comedy. I, it was yeah. just, it was a smart episode. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's a he's a great writer. So you know that that episode was untouched by any of the other writers, which n never happens. You know, yeah. everybody saw the first draft, and we were like, "What are what can we turn this? What are we going to add to this?" Yeah. What was the experience like writing for Kilborn? Did you like the late night atmosphere? I did. Yeah, and Craig is great. I, I don't know if you follow his Instagram, but it's so funny. No, I used to watch the show, but I, I don't follow his Instagram. You should. It's, it's, he's somehow found like the perfect medium for his comedy. He's like hilariously perfectly preserved. Like he doesn't look a day older than he ever did. And the stuff he's posting is just out of this world great. But I had a great time on that show. Craig and I always got along very well. We um, were both big sports fans. And I think I was kind of like the only other legit basketball fan who wrote for the show. So I think he used to, you know, I was more buddy buddy with him. Um, but it was a really fun experience. And uh, I was there for three years and felt like it was time to go at the end of the three years. I, you know, and it turns out that he, he left a couple of years later. So I was, I was glad I left when I did, but uh, yeah, that was a, a really great experience too. Yeah. What is your, like, what's your writing process? Like, do you have a process or just whatever comes to mind, sit down and write? Yeah. It's, I don't have much of a process. And like, if, if to the extent that I have one, I would never recommend it because it's, it's just not very organized at all. Um, I usually write with the TV on, you know, I'm just, I'm watching, so I'm half watching and then writing because I find like, I just, I'm unable to just concentrate on one thing. Yeah. And uh, so I'm kind of scattershot with it, but, I, but I'll get it done. And I, I, I usually work 
fairly quickly when I, when I get going. Well, how important is the TV on in the background? Because I mean, a lot of the stuff you guys write, whether that's from you or the other guys is all references. Like, right. That's true. So, yeah, no, it, that definitely plays into it. I mean, it's, uh, what'll usually happen is like what I'm doing now in quarantine. I'm sure a lot of people are, I'm like rewatching the Sopranos. Uh, ooh, upgraded. Thank you. Let me upgrade you. I just got a message saying the meeting was upgraded. Nice. All right. <laughs> okay, should I, should I speak more? Uh, yeah, this is where I, we get serious. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it, it's, yeah, so I'm binge watching, uh, you know, lots of shows. And so if I were writing a Family Guy script now, I'm sure I would write some Sopranos joke or something, you know. Yeah. Like, and you were saying, like, when you were a child, not a child, but I mean, when you were younger, you were a bit of a stoner and stuff. Like, does that factor into your writing process now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, still there. Like most so, comedians? I think a lot of them, yeah. I mean, uh, no, it's definitely still a part of what I do. It's So it's, um, you know, something I'm pretty comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like, like I was kind of asking if Twitter was an outlet for things that don't make it to the shows or things that maybe push the boundaries a little too far. But I know with Family Guy, there really isn't a line. Is that something you subscribe to that comedy has no line well yes i do i mean i i subscribe to that theory i think comedy should have no line um i think that the you know the the only factor should be is it is it funny and obviously yeah. if, if you're going to go you know push the line or you know go to the edge of what people find acceptable and beyond i think that it just has to be funny you know if if there's some joke about a, a topic that people don't want to talk about or say oh you can't joke about that now well you can if it achieves the goal of making people laugh then it then clearly it's it's okay um so yeah you know i i bristle at at um at censorship not you know in any sort of proud democracy way it's just it feels like people should be able to express themselves however they want and really try to to push it with comedy and uh yeah so i get upset with the pc you know kind of police that monitor stuff although i really can't complain that much because they kind of leave family guy alone which is good because i feel like we've been on for so long people just kind of say oh that's family guy you know which is good let them keep saying that yeah do you guys is there much that gets pushed back or doesn't make it on sure the scripts? yeah i mean it, it's usually you know nitpicky stuff that is very annoying frankly it's you know standards will send back these notes and it's it's usually like replacing certain words you know like or it, we can't describe uh saying stewie uh off you know stewie puts his finger or stewie couldn't say you know oh this doctor put a finger in my rectum like just the in really triggers standards yeah. So like if you hear in or on, like with sexual stuff, even if it's not seen, it's just spoken, they'll say like, oh, you got to change that. Um, it's it's kind of annoying. Yeah. What's a workaround for that? Oh, well, that we that's the thing. We'll have to sit in a room and just say like, we'll have to take find another way of expressing it without in or on or else change the joke completely which is why it creates a lot of in my opinion needless work yeah no. is there an outlet for jokes like that that don't make it well i think uh, i mean depending on how how you know how many how prominently it's featured in an episode I guess sometimes it might be in like deleted scenes on what used to be DVDs. And I mean, I guess they still do sell the DVDs, but whatever the next kind of market is for a family guy episode. And I'm not sure. I don't think on Hulu, they 
run like the sort of uncensored ones. So I, I don't know is the, the short answer to the question. Right. And then now writing for movies, like writing on Ted and things like that, is the process the same or is it quite a bit different? Well, it's different in that there are far less people. Um, but the process for me personally writing uh, off on my own is the same. I mean, I, I'll, you know, have distractions going and, and just a general awareness of what I need to write and when I need to get it done by. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was also a very fun experience, as you might imagine. Yeah. So are you interested in that more than TV or is is there a place for both? I think, yeah, there's a place for both. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't say that I'm interested in movies more than TV because I think I just write a lot more for TV. Um, and, you know, the scale of TV is a little easier to manage, I think, than sometimes than like thinking like, oh my God, I have to write like a 110 page movie. Are you kidding me? Like, so it's all, it's yeah. all just, my whole life is like centered around doing less. <laughs> so yeah, TV fits that mold. Another question that just came to my head, like with stand up, would you be interested in stand up? Like if, if the falling was there and the response was there, did you enjoy doing it? Or is that just not really something you're into? Well, I mean, I would have to say that, yes, I enjoyed it. Like, I mean, you can't help but enjoy when you have like a good experience, you know, like the, yeah. the, the, to, to say like, well, did you enjoy stand up? Yes. I enjoyed being on stage and making people laugh, but it's just everything around it that I just didn't enjoy working harder, you know, going to all, all over the city it was in New York, you know, to try and hit every show. And you had to be like, you know, basically kind of like kiss somebody's ass to get into like different places. Um, you know, I didn't enjoy necessarily, like I, I found a very good group of comedian friends, but there, there were the vast majority of the other comedians were kind of annoying to me as I, I'm sure I was to them. Um, right. So it's not, it's not like a world that you, you'd want to throw yourself into ideally. But if you promised me like, oh my God, there would be, you know, a 2000 seat arenas of people going, yes, <laughs> then I might say like, okay, maybe right. that would be okay. Uh, I got a few questions that I'll rapid fire for you and then I'll, get, I'll let you go. Okay. Um, Jenny Edwards wanted to know if the writing room has any rules, like Seinfeld was famous for having rules like no hugging, no learning. Does Family Guy have any rules like that? None. No None. rules. No, I mean there's there's nothing and i mean i guess the rules basically are like if you're gonna whenever people do like jokes that don't have to do with the uh the show like i don't know if it's like a practical joke or like doing some kind of weird that's always a tricky situation like those can backfire huge i remember yeah. people pulled practical jokes on each other and it was not nothing went right. right. <laughs> so, yeah. I think it's just stick to the script and make funny <laughs> jokes. Um, how long into the show would you say it was no longer just Seth's humor and took on a life of its own? Hmm. Well, I mean, I can't speak for the first three seasons of the show because I wasn't there. Um, but I, I know when it came back in season four, which was when I was first there with a, with a few new hilarious writers, um, Patrick Megan stands out to me as, you know, somebody who's just excellent at, at writing for Family Guy. And I felt like there was an energy there starting in season four that like, holy shit, they brought us back to be on TV. Like that never happens. So like, let's go. This could be like a long running thing. And there was an energy there and Seth was still driving it very much in the, the first like four or five seasons back. But I felt like there were a lot of different hilarious voices in there at that time that, so when Seth took himself out of the process, yeah, obviously it was like a, a hit to us, but there were enough funny people who had 
over now over four or five seasons really developed their ability to write for the show in a way that made it, you know, a pretty a fairly seamless exit for him. Yeah. Um, have you seen like the South Park family guy Simpsons feud, I guess you'd say like, is there, is that real? And like, did you see the episodes where they make fun of you guys and things like that? Absolutely. Well, I would say that the, the Simpsons one, I would say probably started out as kind of real, you know, the Simpsons basically telling family guy to, you know, piss off like a little brother. And, right. and I think that that was, you know, meant in the somewhat mean spirit that it was, you know, put out there. Passive aggressive. Right. But then over the years to the Simpsons credit and also just to the, the way that Hollywood works is like people in the Simpsons and family guy writer pools really commingled over a long period of time, you know, it, to great effect. I mean, they, they really enjoyed each other and the, the Mike Scully guy I worked with and, you know, Seth began to work with a lot of other people, Simpsons people, our people. Then we had the crossover episode in which, you know, they came and did voices for our show and, and uh, that feud, I think, is totally gone. And to the extent that it gets brought up, like we make jokes about the Simpsons only in a way that is like bowing to them. You know, we basically yeah. say, like, you know, you guys are great and we hope to just keep riding your coattails. With South Park, I think that because Family Guy and South Park came out at the, around the same time, South Park looked at Family Guy as like, here comes this big corporate you know, animated show on a big network and we're this little sort of fly by night operation on Comedy Central. And these, you know, we hate these guys. Like they represent like, they got a lot of money behind them. They're, we're, we were basically like this, the sort of, uh, you know, the blonde haired guy and karate kid to their sort of plucky Daniel LaRusso. Um, <laughs> And so they, you know, they, I did see the episode with the manatees and who write yep. for Family Guy, which I thought was a funny joke. Like it's good. <laughs> Again, it's not over a line for me if it, if it seems funny, like that's a funny way of looking at it. And there were many times over the years where a bunch of us tried to sort of prompt Seth to retaliate because we, there were different times when we had like these, I thought funny South Park slams ready to go. And Seth would be like, no, no, no. And to now it's to the point where, I don't think either of them really care. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the individual success speaks for itself. So uh, yeah, I think what's the point? Yeah. Everybody's in their mansions now, so they don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is there any chance of a live action family guy movie ever? Well, live action? No, but a, a family guy movie, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, an animated movie for sure. Um, I know that, Seth talks about that a lot. And I think he's even already got a story planned, which I have no idea what it is, but right. I think it's just a question of Seth, you know, working on Orville for as long as he wants to do that or somebody wants to air it and then saying like, okay, it's the, maybe next is the family guy movie. Yeah. You don't have anything to do with Orville. I don't other than uh, watching it. No, I, I don't. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm just a fan. Of course. <laughs> All right, ma'am. Well, this was an absolute pleasure for me. I'm me a too. big fan. This Thank is awesome. You. Very nice. Thanks for reaching out. A pleasure to do it. Absolutely. And right. uh, stay safe. You too. Cheers. Bye -bye, man.